Good morning. Happy Monday to all. Today is Monday, October 30th, 2023, 9.30 a.m. in conference room 329 at the State Capitol. Also uh, um, public and live via video conference Zoom. Uh, this is the Committee on Health and Homelessness and we are very fortunate to have an informational briefing today on the status of telehealth in the state of Hawaii. This is a critically important informational briefing for the committee. We have members who are present who will be coming in later throughout the uh, morning as well as um, uh, folks who are watching um, on, on Zoom and also publicly as this is broadcast as well. Um, this is, for me, a very important informational briefing as we are coming out of the pandemic and huge strides have been made in telehealth. This is also critically important because um, I heard many of these speakers at a conference on August 9th, 2023. Uh, it was a significant day. It was the day after the Maui wildfires. And then, um, more than ever, I think the importance of our health system, our health ecosystem, and the role that telehealth will be playing in connecting our islands together, for me, became very real. Many of the things that have, we're going to learn about and be informed about today as a committee and as the public um, are strides and um, efforts and initiatives that we are leaders in, I'm proud to report, mm -hmm. from the state of Hawaii. But we are also leaders because we are constantly learning, and that's what the purpose of this informational briefing is in part. So without further ado, I'd like to um, invite, uh, we're gonna have four presentations. I'm going to invite first up Dr. Math Matthew Koenig. Uh, he's the medical director of virtual care at the Queens Health Systems, associate professor of medicine at UH John A. Burns School of Medicine. And his conversation with us, his, his talk with us today is going to be about the possible futures, virtual care after the pandemic. Dr. Koenig. Thanks for having me here today. So um, I'm a neurologist. I'm practicing stroke neurologist at Queens, and I'm also the medical director of telehealth for the Queens Health Systems. And I want to start by saying I don't have any financial disclosures. So I'm going to show a number of technologies with name brands, and I just want to reassure people that I don't have any personal financial stake in any of these companies. Um, so my comments are really about just patient care. Um, and so what do we mean when we talk about telehealth or virtual care? There's different um, varieties of telehealth that we perform as an organization and as a state. Um, a lot of it is direct to patient on their own devices. And so especially during the pandemic, that's the kind of telehealth that really took off. Uh, but we also do hospital-based telehealth for patients who are in hospitals and emergency rooms, and also uh, uh, clinic-based telehealth in brick and mortar clinics, mostly on the neighbor islands. Um, and so I'm gonna start by talking about hospital-based telehealth, or what we call teleconsults. Um, this is data from Queens. Um, so I'm gonna show a fair amount of Queens data, but I'll also point out where I'm showing statewide data beyond mm -hmm. just Queens. Uh, but this is Queens data. So more than half of the teleconsults that we're doing as an organization are specifically for patients with stroke. And so in the first half of my comments today, I'm gonna to focus on stroke care, in part because I'm a stroke neurologist, uh, but in part because that's a very important part of what we do as an organization. I want to um, pause. Do we have this presentation on share screen? I think you may need to share it. Oh, Dr. okay. Koenig. Technical difficulties. Um, how do I do that on Zoom? You gotta use this is where you test if the telehealth guy knows how to do telehealth. I'm going to Zoom. Hmm, Zoom was up. Oh, here we go. No, that's post attendee. Is there a Zoom link out of the legislative session? Okay, here? Oh, here and it. this is where the... Let's see if this will let me share a screen here. I have them sharing screens now. Is that me or you? I will share the screen if that's possible. Or can you also share? I, I'm gonna stop sharing. The host has joined. We'll let them know you're here. Sorry for the delay. No, I think this is an excellent example of why. Should I do the computer audio? Yeah, Okay, I'll mute this one. I'll 
sure of this one and then find there, it. There you go. Oh, and you have to. Okay, we'll get back into it. Sorry for the technical difficulties. This will get into the second half of my talk when I talk about some of the challenges with telehealth uh, and how video teleconferencing has come a long way. So focus, starting on stroke and focusing on stroke, just a few words about why, why timeliness is so important in stroke care um, and how telehealth really helps contribute to making sure that patients get timely care. When there's blockage of blood flow to the brain, and you see it here, a blockage one of the major blood vessels of the brain, there's just not enough blood flow to a lot of the brain that's downstream from that blood vessel. And neurons start dying at a rate of uh, almost 2 million per minute when that's blocked. And so some examples of patients here, this patient treated with clot busters within 90 minutes of symptom onset. Uh, you see a small stroke uh, here that's bright. But the stroke, as time goes by, really increases dramatically in size. Here at 2 hours, here at 2 and a half hours, and here at 4 and a half hours. You see the very rapid growth of the stroke over just some minutes uh, after the symptom onset. Um, there are two main treatments for stroke. One is a clot buster medication uh, that breaks up the blood clot and restores blood flow. And then the other requires a procedure that's only done at some specialty centers in Hawaii. And that represents about 20% of strokes. We call those large vessel occlusions or LVO. Um, so what was the problem that we were trying to solve with telemedicine uh, in the early days of uh, using telemedicine for treatment of strokes? We recognized that there are about 3,000 strokes per year in the state, but very few of these patients were being treated with clot buster medications. And whether you got treated or not in part depended on what hospital you, you presented at with the stroke. And what we saw is that there was a tenfold uh, disparity in treatment rates between hospitals. And, uh, and also, if you were treated, there were often long delays in treatments. Um, so that was the problem that we were trying to solve with telemedicine. And over the last decade, Queens has grown in partnership with 10 other hospitals in the state in what we call a hub and spoke model. So there's a neurologist at Queens who's on call for 11 hospitals at a time using telemedicine to quickly treat stroke patients. And that's had a very beneficial impact on the treatment numbers in the state. And you see here the rise in uh, telestroke or telemedicine consults for stroke patients um, over the last 10 years uh, to the point where we're actually treating more patients by telemedicine than we are in person at, at Punchbowl. And that's had a, a very positive impact on treatment rates for strokes in the state. And you see uh, growth of treatment rates over the last um, 10 years during that period, um, which has been very successful. Also, the time to treatment has improved uh, through this program. So if the neurologist doesn't have to drive into the hospital and see you, um, or you don't have to transfer into hospital to get treatment, then we're able to treat patients much faster using telemedicine. Um, so here you see about 60% of patients are treated within 30 minutes of hospital arrival. And this is statewide data, not just Queens data. Mm -hmm. And that's actually twofold better than the national average uh, in the US for stroke centers. So we've used telemedicine very effectively to shorten the treatment delay um, as a state. And that has had positive benefits for death rates. The stroke remains the number three cause of death in Hawaii overall, but death rates are dropping as it becomes more treatable and we're able to treat patients much more effectively uh, using telemedicine. So as I mentioned, there's two treatments for stroke. One is the clot buster medication. That's available in every state or every emergency room in the state. And so if that's the treatment for your stroke, you really want to be at the nearest hospital to get treatment as quickly as possible. However, one in five strokes require this treatment called mechanical thrombectomy, where the doctor actually has to go in to the blood vessel and do a procedure to restore blood flow. And so in that case, you want to go to a, a hospital that can do that procedure, is capable of doing that. Because if you go to the nearest hospital and have to transfer intra-hospital, that results in major treatment delays. And so what we've done uh, on the island of Oahu is work with the uh, EMS agencies to train the paramedics to recognize these large vessel <laughs> occlusion strokes and uh, using a, a scale called CSTAT and then bypass the nearest hospital and bring the patients to a center that's capable of doing the thrombectomy procedures. Um, what we found in doing that and enacting that back in 2019 is there was a 50% false positive rate, which means the ambulance was being taken out of its neighborhood, 
and hospitals were being bypassed and there was some delay in treatment if the treatment was a clot buster medication. And so in order to uh, enhance that and reduce the false positive rate, uh, we, are, uh, we are doing a pilot program uh, on Oahu, which actually just went live on the Big Island as well, um, doing telemedicine in the ambulance um, between the neurologist who's on call and the paramedics and the patient in the back of the ambulance. And this helps with earlier identification of the patient, being able to take the history and do the physical exam before the patient arrives in the hospital, and then determining the correct location for the patient to be transported to. If the patient just needs clot buster medication, that's the nearest hospital. If the patient needs a procedure to re restore blood flow, we want to bypass the nearest hospital uh, and take the patients to the comprehensive stroke center. Um, and so uh, we are using a telemedicine uh, technology that allows live voice, two-way video, and text exchange uh, between the paramedics and the hospitals. And currently that program is up and running in a pilot fashion for stroke at Queens Main Campus, uh, Queens West, Wahiwa, Kahuku, um, and uh, North Hawaii on the Big Island, uh, as well as Castle Medical Center. Um, so the goals of the project are to uh, avoid unnecessary bypass of EMS, not take the ambulance out of its zone, and ensure the patients with the large vessel blockages um, get, the, get uh, mechanical thrombectomy as quickly as possible, and also to really support the pre-hospital interaction between um, the hospitals, specialists, and paramedics in the field uh, through a HIPAA-compliant platform that allows exchange of information. Um, and so just a quick example of a patient that we treated with this program uh, a couple of months ago. This is a 58-year-old man who is on the North Shore when he developed speech problems and right-sided weakness. Uh, the neurologist was able to see the patient in the field, actually at, at the patient's home, um, and examine the patient along with the paramedics, take a history, talk to the family who witnessed the onset, review the medications, and actually even begin the consent for treatment before the patient arrived at the hospital. Uh, because the patient was recognized to have a potential large vessel occlusion stroke, uh, we bypassed the nearest hospital. The patient was treated at Queens with clot buster medication and then taken for thrombectomy. And here you see the imaging studies showing blockage of the main blood vessel to the left hemisphere of the brain, the left middle cerebral artery, and then lack of blood flow to most of the left hemisphere of the brain. This is a very large stroke in evolution. Uh, if that stroke were to go on and complete, this would be a life-threatening uh, and major disabling stroke. Um, however, the patient got treatment with clot buster medication and a procedure uh, that was successful, and he was actually back to normal by hospital day two. And you see this small stroke here uh, and preservation of the rest of the tissue that had uh, lack of blood flow. So a good example of how uh, being able to see the patient early in before arrival and do a lot of the steps that would otherwise need to be done in the emergency room sped up treatment for the patient. And so the question is, as this moves through its pilot phase, which is funded by a federal grant currently from HRSA, uh, what can Hawaii do as a state to support more robust EMS to hospital and hospital to hospital collaboration using telehealth uh, and exchange of information? And so there's a lot of other potential uses for this kind of technology. So once you get the hospitals and the paramedics used to using telehealth in the field, you can do a lot with that technology, including emergency management and mass casualty incidents, tracking patients who go hospital to hospital when there's a, a, a major public health uh, incident, uh, mental health emergencies and being able to see people in the field who are having mental health crises and not just transporting every patient to the hospital, um, treating and not transporting patients or taking patients to alternate destinations so patients aren't unnecessarily taken to the emer uh, emergency room doing community paramedicine, which are scheduled visits with paramedics uh, for patients in their homes, and then other telemedicine consults in the ambulance beyond telestroke. And so that's sort of ask number one, or, or, or planting the seed number one is, uh, this is currently grant funded um, and limited to stroke, but you know, starting to think as a state about what we can do uh, to have more robust telemedicine collaboration between EMS and hospitals. So I'm gonna pivot to part two here and focus uh, away from the hospital and towards uh, what we call virtual home visits, which is telehealth directly to patients in their home. And this is the growth of telehealth at Queens as an organization. Um, in 2020, we expected to do 2,500 telehealth visits as an organization. 
we ended up doing almost 200,000. Um, Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> we ended up doing almost 200,000 telehealth visits. And you expected to do? 2,500. Okay. So you can see the major growth of telehealth. We were doing telehealth, but it really shot up during COVID here in 2020. And there's been some ups and downs, but the overall trend really is increasing, you know, even as uh, pandemic restrictions have, have opened up. Um, and last uh, fiscal year, we did 189,000 telehealth visits as an organization. And 95% of those were direct to patient in their home, you know, meaning they were not in a clinic or hospital, they were at home using a laptop or their uh, smartphone. And this represents between 15 and 20% of the, of the overall ambulatory visits that Queens is doing as an organization. And so the question is, why did it take a pandemic to get there? You know, why, if we knew that telehealth was the future, why did it take COVID to really catalyze that uh, adoption? There were a number of barriers prior to the pandemic. One was uncertainty about insurance coverage, and the next speaker will talk about that topic in more detail. Uh, there was a lack of consumer demand, meaning people weren't clamoring for it. Providers were, in some cases, slow to adopt. Um, technologies had problems, as evidenced by my difficulty sharing screen with Zoom a moment ago. Um, and then how do you build this into clinic workflows? So COVID really was the perfect storm because it forced adoption of telehealth. Patients were told that it's not safe to go to the doctor's office and wait in the waiting room. Providers were told um, that they had to adopt telehealth to meet the consumer needs and to be safe for patients. And then uh, federal waivers were put in place for reimbursement for uh, Medicare reimbursement for telehealth. And so the question is, um, how did we behave as a healthcare system uh, in the state of Hawaii uh, during, during uh, these, this rapid adoption of telehealth during the pandemic? Uh, one approach might be to say, well, I'm going to do a lot of telephone calls and I'm going to use consumer grade uh, video to, to get some aspect of the physical examination. But otherwise, I'm going to wait for a return to business as usual until you know, the state opens back up and patients start coming back in person. Or on the other hand, do we invest in telehealth in making it, adding value to the in-person care that we uh, provide and to, to you know, uh, have it more integrated into the electronic medical record and, and harness the technologies um, that might improve patient care and complement in-person care. Um, so we you know, spent a lot of time in the last three years talking about telehealth being the future and that it's here to stay. But I think we can't assume that. Um, and there, you know, there's always the potential of a backlash if people had bad experiences with telehealth during the pandemic, that it didn't meet their medical needs or didn't meet their expectations of clinical care the same way an in-person visit with a doctor would do. And so about half of patients when they were surveyed and they were asked if you did telehealth visits during the pandemic, which would you prefer after the pandemic, doing visits in person or virtually? And about half of respondents said they would prefer returning to in-person care primarily. So I think we can't assume that um, telehealth, if it doesn't meet patients' needs and it doesn't uh, meet providers' needs for physical examination, um, that there could be a backlash and people might not uh, want to adopt that moving forward. So lessons learned at Queens, one is patient selection is very important, making sure that the care provided virtually is clinically appropriate, number one. That patients are prepared for visits and have technology that will enable a safe visit with their doctor uh, focusing on the provider and patient experience that it seemed professional and meet the clinical needs on both sides. That the platform is easy enough to use that it doesn't push people away who are not proficient with the technology. Um, and that it integrate with an in-person clinic workflow. So prior to the pandemic, these were a lot of the issues that we, or questions that we focused on related to telehealth. We talked a lot about convenience, uh, that it be convenient for patients to see the doctor virtually and not have to take time off work, and that it be very timely. And I showed you with stroke how timeliness is very important. But we also wondered or we were concerned about whether we could make a virtual visit equivalent to in-person care, you know, whether it could be as good as an in-person visit. And that was a lot of the focus of discussion. And I would suggest that it's perhaps a fool's errand to try and replace in-person medical care with virtual care. Uh, there's a lot that happens in an in-person visit that you don't want to necessarily try and replicate virtually or, or maybe shouldn't try to replicate uh, virtually. That that in-person care, the, 
the closeness of the doctor and patient, the ability to touch the patient, uh, is in many ways sacrosanct, and that's not something that we should try and completely replace. And so the conversation really is more about how do we use telehealth to add value to in-person care, to complement in-person care. Um, perhaps establishing care in person and then, and then seeing a patient more uh, regularly, virtually, but not trying to fully replace that in-person care. And so it really is much more than about convenience. Um, and I show you some examples here from other sectors of the economy like banking, travel arrangements, or ordering food at a restaurant, and how that has gradually become virtual. People are using their phones to do their banking, to schedule their travel and arrange their travel plans and even to order food at a restaurant. And a lot of that is not more convenient, right? We've actually taken work that other people would do on our behalf, and we've shifted that work onto ourselves. And I would suggest that telehealth also does that, um, but in a positive way, you know, meaning if patients are using a technology, uh, and specifically a patient portal, to get into their virtual visit, there's a lot that they can do within that technology that actually improves their own understanding of their healthcare. They can read their notes, review their lab work, uh, schedule visits, uh, and do other activities like medication reconciliation, reviewing their medications to make sure they're accurate. That actually improves patients' understanding of their own health care, um, even if it's a little bit more work for them to get into that visit. Um, and so really it's about adding value to the in-person care, not just about convenience. Uh, yes, providing access to patients who otherwise may not be able to see a specialist, but also activities like remote family presence that the family can join virtually in the visit, language interpretation services, uh, collaboration between multiple providers, and getting patients uh, into, the, uh, uh, into the patient portal and being able to review their medical records. Um, those are all activities that I think add value um, beyond just the video replacement of an in-person visit. And so Queens as an organization has very heavily invested in the last three years into integrating telehealth into the electronic medical record. Um, so the provider has access to all of the patient's information, can do ordering, can write their notes, uh, all within the EMR during the video visit. And then the patient can access that visit through the patient portal, which in, the, in our case is called MyChart. And then within MyChart, there's a lot of other activities that patients can do that add value to their, to their healthcare. And so, you know, going back to this question of, are we just waiting for a return to normal and just get back to all in-person care, or do we invest uh, as a state and as healthcare organizations into making telehealth more robust? Um, and so, uh, you know, along those lines, there's a lot on the horizon here. So when you add two computers between the patient and the provider, and you take that patient's speech and the doctor's speech and the things that they're saying and the patient's appearance, and information in the medical record that exists on those computers and turn it into zeros and ones, there's a lot that you can actually do that you can't necessarily do in person when you examine the patient. And so moving beyond this question of can we make a telehealth visit as good as an in-person visit, the question really is what can the telehealth visit uh, bring that adds value that actually are activities that you couldn't do in person and I think we're getting to that point now with device integration. There are devices in the patient's home that measure their blood pressure, their pulse, other physiological parameters, and th that can be uploaded into the telehealth visit, um, as well as uh, the patient's voice and appearance and the things that the patient and the doctor are saying during the visit, um, and using that to, to write the patient's notes. So the doctor is not spending like 15 minutes with the patient, and then 15 minutes after the visit documenting everything in the computer. Some of those processes can be automated when you put a computer between the doctor and the patient. And so that's the future that we're moving towards. And the question will be, you know, what's going to be the impact on clinical care and practice as we make this transition? Number one is that the consumer preferences are going to play a much greater role. You know, patients were told, you have to do telehealth. Now it's more like this is an option for you. And so what's the value in it for the patient beyond just convenience to make the patient want to do telehealth? Uh, I talked about transitioning from a, just a temporary solution to something that's professional grade. Uh, and I, uh, we, you know, the question really is how do we harness the power of computers to care for patients but not push people away with technology that are not proficient with computers or don't have good broadband coverage. And I think Bert Lum is going to talk on about digital equity uh, later in the day here. Um, and then how do we 
um, change clinic workflows to integrate telehealth uh, into in-person practice. And so I'll leave you with these discussion points. One is, as a state, how, how invested are we um, in maintaining robust uh, and growing, really, robust virtual care programs as the pandemic winds down? What statutory, regulatory, and budgetary changes um, are needed to support virtual care as a state? Uh, how do we leverage virtual care to improve access to care and not push people away, you know, who may, uh, you know, worsening the, what's called the digital divide for vulnerable populations that don't have access to technology? Um, and then finally, what data and analytics are needed to ensure that the virtual care services uh, we're providing add value to patient care? And I showed you in the beginning how we did that for stroke, because we improved the speed of treatment and treatment rates. And I just can't show you the same data for what, what has happened with telehealth mm -hmm. as a state. Um, and what I can tell you is that the volume of telehealth has gone up tremendously. What I can't tell you is, is that good, bad, or indifferent? Um, and that's really a question for us as a state, is what is the quality of the telehealth that's occurred with this massive public adapt adoption of telehealth? Where should we invest in making it better and more robust? Um, and you know, so that's where we really need data as a state. And so I bring this back to um, a piece, uh, a, a concurrent resolution that was submitted last year, and uh, we ran out of time, I think, in the legislative session. This was HCR 49. And what this did was request the establishment of a telehealth working group to examine the impact of widespread telehealth adoption during the pandemic, uh, and the effect on the safety, patient outcomes, and the cost of care. Um, and this is a great, uh, I think, purpose of government, is mm -hmm. to act as a convener to get healthcare organizations and insurance companies together who have this data, but it's all in separate pieces, and review it to determine uh, what the impact has been of telehealth adoption, where should we invest, what regulatory changes should be put in place uh, in the future to make sure that we're investing wisely uh, in telehealth and improving patient outcomes. Um, and not simply adding to cost of care. And so I will leave you uh, there, and I'm gonna, I think, pass it over to yes, my colleague. Yes, if you can pass, and pass the computer over to uh, Dr. Higa, and she can start getting that ready. I wanna welcome my colleague, uh, Representative Diamond Garcia from District 42. 42. Um, we're gonna have the presenters here through the 11.30 a.m. hour. Um, if you have specific questions for Dr. Koenig, very specific questions while we're, they're working on getting the other um, slideshow up, we can ask those questions. Dr. Koenig, if I can um, ask you a question. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And then, Tom, can you move another uh, microphone for Dr. Higa, please? And you can return the microphone okay. to yourself. Also, can we ask Stacey Alters to email Sylvia Mann the link at her uh, Department of Health. Uh, all right. Sure. Sure. So we are having presenters from all over the world actually join us. I want to thank uh, Stacy Mann, who's going to be uh, Stacy Aldrich, and Sylvia Mann, who are actually both videoing in, zooming in from different parts of the world. I understand. Um, so as we're fixing that up, uh, Dr. Koning, I have a very specific question just on the um, the pilot program. Um, do you know if there are any other pilots with EMS and any other hospital systems um, for this telehealth? Because this is, this is fascinating to me, and this is the first time I'm learning about this pilot project. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. So I am not aware of any other telemedicine uh, pilots with other healthcare systems and EMS yet. I know there's been a lot of interest in that in various areas. Okay. And so I think what we don't want is five different platforms, right? So that's, you know, because EMS is not you know, it's like, okay, it's Zoom for Kaiser and it's this for Queens and what have you. So I think that's where as we get data about the impact of this project, we should kind of pause and talk as a state about what makes sense so okay. we have something that's at least interoperable between healthcare systems. When will the first report from this pilot program be coming out? Yeah, we actually had the first full year of data uh, that we reported last month. And so we're putting that together, you know, as a slide set to um, I think start to tell that story. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think we'll be sharing data shortly. I think that it'll be fascinating to see, and again, because of the work being done across hospitals, across islands, 
and the fact that you have shortened treatment times between stroke patients and essentially saved lives, this is critical data that we need. I will also say that I appreciate pointing out the telehealth working group, and I can remember a time when we actually had the um, stroke working group, which led to the telestroke program. So very important um, work for us to continue to do. Um, we'll come back to you because I think there might be more questions, but um, Dr. Higa, are you ready? So next up is um, Christina Higa, PhD co-director of the Pacific Basin Telehealth Resources Center housed in the UH Manoa College of Social Scientists. She's here to present us with a uh, presentation on telehealth policy updates for the public who's watching. Each of these presentations will be placed on our um, briefing materials on, on our website. So this is going to be available to the public as well. And I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Higa. Thank you so much. And thank you, Representative Bellotti, for putting together this informational uh, briefing and allowing us to share information and all your support for telehealth over the years. Um, I'm Christina Higa. I am the director of the Pacific Basin Telehealth Resource Center. And I'm joined today by my co-director, Sylvia Mann, who is um, participating virtually, and also the dean of the College of Social Sciences, Denise Conan, who's joining us in person here today. Um, to start, I wanted to introduce our program. We are the Pacific Basin Telehealth Resource Center. We are one of 14 federally funded telehealth resource centers in the country. There are two uh, national centers, one that's focused on technology and the other on telehealth policy. So they follow and track telehealth policy all across the country. The other 12 of us are regional centers. So collectively, there is a resource center that covers every state and territory in the United States. And our PBTRC serves the state of Hawaii and the US affiliated Pacific Islands. I wanted to note that we don't provide direct clinical care, so we're not that kind of a network, but we're a resource center to provide technical assistance to support the advancement of care. With this slide, I just wanted to show the collaboration and the real working partnerships with all the resource centers. I just came back from an uh, in-person meeting from all of them this past weekend, and I wanted to note the website here, Telehealth Resource Centers with a plural, .org, and that gives you access to all of the other resource centers. I would like to frame today's uh, discussion around digital equity for all, and I'm very thankful that we have Bert Lum on our panel today who has been really spearheading the digital equity and broadband initiatives in Hawaii and bringing together the um, stakeholders in Hawaii. We really have a collective understanding that's very comprehensive of digital equity for all, and all is an acronym for ACCESS access to devices and broadband literacy, the actual know-how to use those devices for livelihood, education, employment, entertainment, and even healthcare. And many people are referring to digital equity now as a super determinant of health because it's so critical in impacting the healthcare outcomes for all social determinants of health. And also all is inclusive, so we, want to, we don't want to leave anybody out. We want to make sure all our vulnerable populations are included in that. I wanted to just also explain our focus areas, although I'm not going to present on that this morning, but PBTRC focuses on maternal telehealth, disabilities and telehealth, Pacific Island veterans care, and uh, we're having discussions on Alice and the houseless population and how we might include telehealth as uh, increasing as access to service gaps there. So for today, my focus will be on telehealth policy. Um, I will start with a little bit of terms, but Dr. Koenig helped us a lot, um, so I may not have to spend as much time there. But we're gonna look at federal and state telehealth policy updates and then pull out some highlights for uh, needed policy refinement in Hawaii. So we use the term telehealth, which is uh, the use of technology. It's an overarching definition, so it includes use of technology for delivery of clinical care, public health, as well as education. And a lot of people hear telemedicine. Well, that's a subset of telehealth, so that's primarily clinical services. But as you heard in Dr. Koenig's presentation, there are other terms used interchangeably as well, uh, specifically virtual health, e-health, connected care. 
But there's also another term that is even above telehealth that's broader, and it's digital health. So that's a term being used a lot now, and that encompasses uh, the various digital technologies, devices, algorithms, like AI, and platforms, and that's all right. It's coming. It's already here, right? So um, I also wanted to point out when we talk about policy, there's some very nuances in reimbursement terminology, and that helps us to define if and how services are reimbursed. Um, it helps us define the requirements. And as Dr. Koenig mentioned, mentioned um, ideally, this kind of very precise uh, terminology and coding may be able to help us track effectiveness um, of the services and cost, cost efficiencies of specific services. Um, but just to, as an example, I won't go into all the billing and coding, but here I'm showing CMS's um, communication technology based definitions for virtual check in, for example, e visits, consults, all of these things they actually don't even consider telehealth. Um, but it is in a special category that can be reimbursed, but it has to be um, within certain limitations of time with the patient and follow up at, and type of technology, et cetera. I did want to mention another important point is telehealth is delivered in many different ways. So a lot of times when people hear the term telehealth, they think video conference with a doctor and a patient. It could be um, a primary care provider to a, a specialist, that's telehealth as well. But we also have store and forward, where it's an asynchronous transmission of images or tests for later consultation. Remote patient monitoring, as Dr. Koenig mentioned, which is the continuous uh, collections and transmission of physiologic or biometric data, like blood glucose or blood pressure, you know, to manage chronic disease. And then I have a blue line there, and under the blue line is M Health for mobile health, because that's just saying using your mobile devices. But I put that under the blue line because you could use it for maternal, I mean, remote patient monitoring or real time video conferencing. It's just a, a, a technology used for telehealth. So moving forward to the federal telehealth policies, as we all know, uh, there was a lot of waivers to create flexibility so that providers could use telehealth um, during the pandemic. And prior to this, CMS was very restrictive on some of these things. And they since created these um, waivers that were lifted in geographic location, list of services, categories of providers, and even type of technology. So now that the pandemic ended in May, what next? Um, what happens to these waivers? Some were made permanent by change in law. Um, some are extended through December 2024, and others ended. So we'll, we'll go through that. When we're talking about telehealth policy development, it's really important to look at um, two major factors. One is what can be changed and has to be changed to statutory <laughs> changes in law and others through regulation. So two key um, milestones in this is that we had the consolidated consolidated Appropriations Act 2023, I'll refer to it as CAA, <laughs> um, that had some permanent changes for telehealth law. And then CMS uh, issued the physician's fee schedule for calendar year 2024. So that's in regulation. And we're waiting for that to be finalized. But that's important because that gives us a, a view into the future of what can be built for telehealth. Just a quick review of the temporary Medicare. Again, this is federal, so it's all Medicare changes through December 2024. Uh, patient geographic location, so Medicare patients can be seen anywhere, including their home. Eligible Medicare health telehealth providers. Telehealth services can be provided by all eligible Medicare providers right now. This is temporary, including occupational, physical, and speech therapists, but that's only through December 2024. After that, we don't, we don't know if they'll be included. However, there are some permanent providers added to the list through the CAA, so by law. Um, and that includes marriage and family therapists and mental health counselors. Finally, audio-only services. Um, Medicare will allow some audio-only telehealth services to go through 2024, in particular evaluation and management. Um, however, there is a permanent change to allow audio only for behavioral mental health. 
So talking about the permanent changes in behavioral mental health, it's really only behavioral mental health when I talk about telehealth changes at the federal level. Medicare patients can receive telehealth services um, with no geographic restrictions. This is even beyond 2024. Um, the audio only is allowed, but with some caveats. So the provider must have the capability of providing video conferencing, but the patient can prefer to use audio only. So Medicare is uh, avoiding having Medicare only, audio only docs, right? They want people to be able to have the capacity to do full telehealth with audio and video. FQHCs and RHCs can serve as distant site providers for behavioral mental health services, and behavioral mental health services will require an in-person visit um, within the first six months of the initial assessment and every year after that. So it requires an in-person. Another big area is uh, the Drug Enforcement Agency and their most recent expansion of prescribing controlled substances via telehealth. So there's actually a law already in the books called the Ryan Hate Act that provides seven exceptions to um, requiring an in-person evaluation before prescribing controlled substances via telehealth. So they, they, they can waive that in-person and um, if you have these different seven exceptions, and we've been writing on exception five because of the public health emergency. So that was supposed to end when the public health emergency ended, but they expanded it through 2023 of November. And then most recently, uh, the DEA opened a um, call for um, pr new proposed comments on proposed rulemaking, and they received 38,000 um, input and comments on that and held a two day long public hearing. And so the very compelling reason to extend that further. So that will go through um, December 2024. So basically that authorizes the prescription of schedule two and five controlled medication um, for the, and also uh, schedule three to five narcotic controlled medication that's used for substance use disorder. Um, we do need to comply with the DA rules and guidance and also other federal and state laws. So when it comes to controlled substances, um, you really need to look at what law is stricter. So um, if the, whatever law is stricter, the federal or state, that law prevails. And so this was brought to my attention recently that for Hawaii, we do have a law that requires the provider who's pres prescribing the controlled substances to be located in the state of Hawaii. And I've been told that's problematic for some people who, um, for example, Dr. Koenig and I were just talking right before this, if someone um, has um, is it um, epilepsy and seizures and the provider is di um, providing that prescription from uh, far, right through telehealth, um, they wouldn't be able to provide the prescription unless they were in state. And, and we can expand on that later as well. The other point is it requires a bona fide physician, physician patient relationship. And I will speak later about a law that we do have that re allows telehealth to be used to provide physician patient relationship. So moving on to the state, our Hawaii telehealth policies. And I think everyone is really familiar with our Hawaii 2016 telehealth law is really one of the most progressive laws in the country. Uh, we adopted many flexibilities that were um, even before the pandemic. Um, and now a lot of those flexibilities have become commonplace for other states and they've made it also permanent. Um, this law uh, applies to Medicaid as well as private insurers. It requires parity for service and payment. It requires malpractice coverage and it lifts the restrictions on the originating sites that I had just mentioned. I went through, you know, the geographic locations, all of that, that, that Medicare has lifted temporarily. Um, and it also expands the definition. It has a broad definition to include store and forward, remote, remote monitoring, live consultation and M health. We often get asked a lot of questions about our telehealth laws here, so I pulled out a, a few of the frequently asked questions. And this one about patient-physician relationship, 
it can be established via telehealth rather than having to be done in person. Um, a lot of people ask about the broad definition of it includes audio only for actually having a patient provider have uh, consultation by audio only. And uh, the answer has been no, not in a definition of telehealth. And more recently, it's expanded to allow to be used for behavioral health, which I'll mention a bit later. And then the, the next top question is, I'm a provider in California, another state. Do I need a Hawaii state medical licensure to care for patients who are living in your state? And the answer is yes. Um, in order to provide telehealth to anyone in Hawaii, you need a Hawaii state medical license. license. And so now I'm going to just pull out a few of the highlights. We have a fantastic law, but there's some refinement with changing of times. And the first one is on medical licensure. So as I just mentioned, you know, it's ch generally, and not just Hawaii, but most states, is where the patient is located is where you would need your medical licensure. Um, and so here's a scenario. You have a University of Hawaii student. Oh, did I say University of Hawaii? I just meant to say university student uh, moving to Hawaii for school. Um, and he, can he continue care with his mental health professional that he was seen in California? The answer would be yes if that provider is licensed to in Hawaii. No if not, right? The other way around, I'll just skip to the third bullet. My patient is on vacation in Florida. This is a Hawaii patient provider. Can I see her while she is visiting in Florida? Can I see her via telehealth to, to have continuity of care? And the answer would be you need to check with Florida to see what their state laws are because the patient's located there. Um, there are some existing options, or soon to be, so I want to thank all of you for passing the interstate compact bill in last session because that helps Hawaii join 41 um, states and Guam in streamlining the Medicare licensing but maintaining the Hawaii State Board process um, and approval process. This we think will really help um, with our healthcare shortage, making it more streamlined to get licensed, but also it will, as you can see, help access to care for telehealth providers because they need to be um, Hawaii licensed. One, the next bullet there is not necessarily a policy rule but a practice that doesn't require any action, but patients could go under the supervision of an in-state provider and then just cons the, the out-of-state provider consult. Our National Telehealth Research Center for Policy just came out with this fall um, policy report that looks at insights and state level trends. And I wanted to share that um, 26 states, they report in that in this report, um, 26 states have special license or telehealth registration. So this could be another option, um, but you know I, I'm not presenting this as uh, anything we studied or we have not asked stakeholders yet, but I just wanted to share information of some trends in other states. And this special license, for example, in Idaho would not require a Idaho medical license um, after some conditions, but they would still allow a provider to provide patients to patients in Idaho who are just there temporarily for business or work or education or vacation. So just temporarily, patients going on a vacation, they could, someone could still s do telehealth visits to see their patient in Idaho uh, without a license. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt. So yeah. would this address the, the issue that you raised about a uh, Hawaii resident on vacation in yes. Florida? This That's would, this, this would, would address the that, yes. Okay. Thank you. And then they also address, you know, the term temporary. Well, w maybe the person moved for permanent. They actually got up and moved there, but it, this law allows them to have a temporary transition period until that person can find a local provider to assist them. There's another sample, which is a slightly different model, and this is in Florida. They use a out-of-state telehealth registration so there's an application to the medical board and various terms they need to agree on, um, including you know not opening up shop in person, uh, not opening up an office to provide in-person services, and also I in Florida, for example, they have to use a licensed pharmacy there. Um, but the providers also pay the medical board a fee, and then they are able to conduct telehealth services without a license. Just some um, examples. The next is audio only, and I want to thank you for um, passing the law into um, the bill into law that allows audio only for behavioral mental health. 
uh, that is a start. And as I mentioned, Medicare um, has done this permanently. So some differences between Medicare and our state law is that ours is at an 80% reimbursement rather than full parity. And also ours um, is only through December 2025. So the feedback that we're getting is that there's major potential for audio only for a lot of things it's not good for. I think Dr. Conan can talk about some things that we cannot do telehealth with audio only. But other things like chronic disease management could be used very well for audio only. Everyone addresses, you know, we need to be careful that we're not driving structural inequalities by limiting access to audio only type of services. And again, reiterating, in, in order for you to make these policy decisions, you need to be informed. And so I also support Dr. Koenig's um, ask for a working group so we can study these things and give you the data that you need so you can make better decisions. And the last two slides that I have, um, this one is regarding the Medicaid telehealth policy updates. Um, they put it out as a draft to solicit comments and it's very good in clarifying what will continue on and not, and also defining you know, our audio only for behavioral health and clarifying some, some definitions. But one point that's drawing a lot of feedback is that this policy for Medicaid is rolling back the ability for FQHC doctors to provide telehealth in their home. So it, only, it requires them to provide their telehealth services in the clinic um, or a HRSA approved location. And the feedback that we have received is uh, people are very appreciative of Medicaid, you know, and the commitment to improving access to quality of care. I mean, look at the waiver proposals that they have. It's so innovative and could really help a lot of people. But the FQHCs are asking for these waivers to be reinstated um, and for the providers to be able to provide telehealth services from home and further with their prospective payment rate, which is a higher rate. Um, you know, taking a look at some of the justifications for this, if, if they're being required to do telehealth from their office, they have access to their electronic health records and telehealth platform, they can get that same access through a uh, virtual private network secure link from their home. They can get access to their EHR and also their uh, telehealth platform. You know, the patient is not in the clinic, so there's not losing any touch points if the doctor is in the clinic. If the doctor's in the clinic or doctor's at home, patient is not in, in, close to them in any case. So that was one of the things we're hearing. Um, as you know, it's so, so difficult with our healthcare shortage to retain FQHC docs, and people feel that this flexibility taken away is not gonna help that. Um, I wanna mention, though, um, that from the meeting I just came from this past weekend, HRSA is saying that the National Service Corps is also rolling back this, the same as what Medicaid is proposing. They will not be able to do telehealth from home. We don't understand the justification for that, but I would like to note, I did learn while I was there that several states have made it permanent that their FQRC providers can provide service from home. That includes California, Maryland, Kentucky, and New York. And then there are several other states, maybe six or seven, that um, don't explicitly say telehealth, but providers can provide service outside of their center. And so uh, just to wrap it up, I really want to emphasize um, that as we advance telehealth, we really need to also advance digital equity for all because we, we're using technologies, connectivity, you know, skill sets. We cannot reinfor reinforce existing inequalities. So that's kind of teeing up for the presentations for the rest of this informational briefing. Um, and so I just want to thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Higa. I want to welcome uh, my vice chair, and I'm going to ask Stacy um, and Sylvia to get primed up. I can say I can share your presentation from my computer if you'd like me to. Or if you can do that, Stacy, if you and Sylvia can come on and just let us know how you want to handle this. Um, again, I want to welcome my vice chair, Jenna Takenouchi, uh, and see if there are any specific questions for either Dr. Koenig and Dr. Higa at this point in time, just because the subject matter is really close as we're waiting for um, Stacy and Sylvia to get online. I believe Sylvia is sharing. Yes, perfect. So I don't have to do that. <laughs> 
Um, any questions? Okay, um, I want to comment on the Medicaid because my hope is that we're going to have a, a number of informational briefings following you folks as the first one. But a lot of these questions are circulating in the community, so we are asking those same questions. I will say that we have to look at what other states are doing, and because telehealth is an experiment nationwide, and we have to braid all of these authorities and resources, that's one of the things that we have to go. So we're going slow, and I think that study again is really important, but I also think we have to have the conversations with all of the um, players in our health ecosystem, which is what we're doing. Um, as I'm wrapping up that comment, um, Stacy, can I turn it over to you and Dr. Mann, and I will let you folks um, speak. Um. This is Sylvia, and I'm going to go first, and then Stacy's going to follow um, with what's happening at the library. So, um, hello from very far away in Hong Kong. <laughs> so it's very early in the morning. Oh, Sylvia, um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I need to introduce you folks. So, Sylvia is um, the co-director for PBTRC, as well as um, supervisor for the genomic section, the Hawaii Department of Health. And Stacy Aldrich is our Hawaii State Librarian. Members, I asked them to do this presentation because it's actually very, I think, cutting edge for Hawaii. Again, we are leaders in health, and they are really pushing the boundaries. And I think that this pilot project that is going to be taking off shows some of the possibilities as well as um, raises questions about what else we can do. So now turning it over to Sylvia. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Representative. Um, I actually retired from the health department September 1st, <laughs> so, but I'm, I'm volunteering back for this project, so <laughs> I still am involved in the project, just uh, not as the supervisor of the genomic section. Um, so this whole project started out um, as a very small kernel of an idea that we had as um, we were going through the pandemic. Christina and I were very, very busy trying to get people up on telehealth. So um, we were part of the broadband um, uh, work group, and that helped us meet Stacy at the library. And we we're like, Stacy, you've got a library. We want to do telehealth. And uh, she said, Yeah, let's do it. So this is how it happened, and um, we are very grateful for our broadband hui to bring us all together so that we can actually create and support projects like this. So our funding for this project actually comes to the, from the CDC, from COVID money um, that came to the Department of Health. And Department of Health said, well, what would you like to do? And I said, I want to put telehealth access points in libraries and then do uh, mobile clinic van telehealth for those people who can't get to the library. So this is funded through our CDC COVID-19 funding, which luckily we just heard that will be extended until 2026. So we have time to do more work in this area because it certainly is taking us more time to get set up than we thought. So we initially had proposed that we would have 15 libraries in underserved communities um, be set up to do telehealth and to have telehealth navigators help communities um, get on because not everybody knows how to use the computer as we all know. I know from my mom, um, I help her with telehealth. So it really, I guess I'm her telehealth navigator. Um, so we thought that we would have telehealth navigators in the libraries with the um, computers and have a private room for them to be able to do telehealth sessions if they could not do them from home. So these are the libraries that we had started with. So we have libraries that will have the access points, which are in the left-hand box. And then we have libraries where we also don't have the access points, but we have the laptops and hotspots to lo loan out for people. Um, there is an asterisk next to Kaului because that was added as a library as part of the Maui Recovery um, CDC when they realized the disaster happening in Maui, they were very flexible and said, Sylvia, if you need to redirect funding to Maui and have more activities on Maui to make sure that people have access to health care, please tell us and we can redirect money to Maui and help in the recovery. So that has been really, really helpful to us. 
So we are piloting this project, which is an, a collaboration of the Department of Health, the library system, Pacific Basin Telehealth Resource Center, University of Hawaii, and we work with community-based organizations on each island because we know that unless we're working with the people on the island, we aren't going to get very far just trying to do all our work from Honolulu where most of us are based. So we have telehealth navigators who recruit from the local community. So these are paid positions um, and they are part of the community because we want to make sure that the people that are helping navigate are known in the community and understand their community and know the people in their community. So it's a very friendly atmosphere at the library. The services at the library include how to navigate digitally, learning about telehealth, because not everybody knows what telehealth is. Having a telehealth visit in the private rooms, we, for the libraries that don't have uh, private rooms, we are, this project pays for those the portable office pod, which um, is contained so you can't hear what people are saying inside. And um, I have to laugh because when I was looking at them, I didn't realize that the pods would need ventilation systems because if they're soundproof, they people still need to breathe inside of them. So um, that was an interesting find for me that um, the pods actually have ventilation systems. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the users of the library can borrow hotspots and Chromebooks to do telehealth at home. So for our navigators, they are going to be getting a lot of training. So of course, they're going to have digital literacy training, and that's through a North Star program that the library has funded. They'll have telehealth training, which is adapted from telegenetics training that actually I developed um, through a funded project um, with our Western States Regional Genetics Network and the health department. And then there's a lot of additional training. We're looking at mental health first aid. That's the type of training to help the navigators understand how to deal with people with possible mental health issues um, if they come into the library and want to um, do a telehealth session. We have, uh, we're looking at doing things like CPR training. We have cultural competency training. There's just a lot of training available. And so we want to prepare our navigators the best that we can. And then we have telehealth spaces, as I said before. Inside spaces are either private rooms at the library or these office pods we talked about. But of course, sometimes people can't get to the library. So we have mobile clinic vans that we're purchasing. Um, and inside the clinic van, it's equipped to um, not only do an examination if we had to, it's also equipped to do telehealth. And one of the things that we're um, finding is that we'll probably be connecting through the Starlink satellite internet system. And for the Maui recovery, what's happened is that Elon Musk has actually put the satellites in a daisy chain over Hawaii so that we can have good satellite internet access. And that was one of the things we we're worried about, but it's working very well during Maui recovery. So that's like our in-person test of internet connection. So that makes it good for us before we purchase it. Also for the mobile clinic vans, we're looking at things like if you have a high-risk pregnancy on a neighbor island, um, we want the pregnant woman may not want to or can't travel to Honolulu. So we could roll the mobile clinic van up to their home and then we could have telehealth ultrasound um, and then also teach them how to do at home fetal monitoring. So these neighbor island pregnant women would not have to travel hopefully to uh, Honolulu and have to stay in the hospital until the rest of their pregnancy is over, um, which makes neighbor island women very happy because most pregnant women like to have their support system around them when they're pregnant. So those are some of the things that we're looking at doing, which are really exciting to me because I think that um, portable ultrasound is really cool. So we had talked about the hotspot and Chromebooks. So one of the things will be that our navigators will help make sure that the person understands how to use the hotspot and the Chromebooks or laptops. Um, um, I think Stacy was saying that uh, they might be purchasing laptops too, um, can be loaned from the library and that they know how to use it at home now, 
not everybody's home will have ability to get connection to a hotspot. But if they can get it and know how to use um, the computer, then they can actually do their own session at home. And so the summary of our project goals are, of course, we're trying to increase access to health services and education for underserved communities in Hawaii using telehealth. Um, this is also a workforce development because we have um, telehealth navigator positions, community health worker positions, project coordinator positions. So what we're trying to do is help people step up the ladder in working in healthcare um, because then they get paid more at each step. So at the beginning for telehealth navigators, we only require high school graduation or GED with no experience because we'll teach you um, how to do telehealth navigation. So that is a really good beginning step for someone who does want to work in the healthcare sector. Um, we definitely, as part of the health department, we always want to support families to be healthy and productive, and we believe telehealth is one of the ways to do it. And then, of course, our last part, which got added, is to help Maui recover by supporting telehealth access for the um, families in Maui. Thank you, Sylvia. I'm going to turn it over to Stacy now, and then we'll open up to questions on this innovative project that you folks are both working on. Stacy, can you share your screen? Yes. Aloha, Chair. Thank you so much. Can you see my screen? Yes, Oops. we can. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, Sylvia did a wonderful job, and there might be a few things that I'm just um, going to build upon. Uh, but first, I just wanted to give some context for why libraries, because a lot of people might think, why would a library be the place that you would have telehealth? And, you know, the mission of the library is really to create opportunities for people to be connected and the connect part is so important. And our area of the focus for the library really are about um, igniting our digital futures, creating opportunities for life enrichment and deepening community relationships and strengthening literacy, um, all which tie into basic health and um, connecting to um, the resources that people need access to. So definitely these three, and also if you think about health literacy. And then because we're, li we're hubs in every community, we have uh, 51 branches on six islands, I'm going to continue to say 51 even though our our line of branch is not there anymore, but we are going to build again. Um, we have, uh, oops, apologies, went back. Um, whoops, sorry, let me go back here. We have, um, we have technology, we have space, we have um, wireless um, connectivity for people who have their own connections. We have people to help and we have resources that can help people with information. So as um, Sylvia mentioned, there's two key areas that the libraries are going to provide support. So we have telehealth tech bags um, that we have pulled together. We got um, emergency connect funds to purchase 300 uh, Chromebooks that will go into each of these bags along with um, hotspots. Um, we are still waiting for the hotspots and I'll talk a little bit about that in the challenges in just a second. And then we'll, we are going to be a place where we'll have telehealth navigators. Um, our staff can help people with basic information and basic digital literacy, um, but there's a greater need to have focused um, coaching uh, for people to not only use the technology, but to also help them find information that relates to whatever um, health issue uh, that they're dealing with. And so having a telehealth navigator is, I think, crucial uh, to have in the libraries to be somebody who can be there. And what we're finding uh, in uh, hearing from the public about what's important to them, having one-on-one -on -one, um, connections with people who can help them with technology is very important. So this telehealth navigators are, are, are very important. So right now we have the laptops, we have the bags, and we're starting to, to get to hire some of the telenavigators. I think the first one is going to be in Hilo. It looks like we have one uh, person um, who will be our first telehealth navigator who will go through the training that Sylvia mentioned. And we are, uh, again, recruiting for telehealth navigators in all of the areas that you can see on the left um, on all of the islands. So um, what we're finding in terms of challenges are two things, the hotspots. Um, we, it, it was a challenge to get the contracting done for the hotspots. Once we did get the hotspots, 
um, they were going to be difficult for the libraries to actually manage um, because they had built-in SIM cards that could be popped out and people could take them and use them in other places and then we didn't, wouldn't have any control over them. So um, our uh, project manager, Karen Kessing, has been trying to work with all the parties and with um, the uh, mobile uh, telecom provider to uh, provide another opportunity for us to better manage the hotspots that would be in the bags with the um, with the uh, Chromebooks. And then the second challenge we have are actually finding navigators. And I've seen several other uh, organizations uh, looking for people who to be these digital navigators. And I think that's another uh, challenge for us is how do we find the right people who are uh, have technical skills, who are curious, and, and who want to help people get connected to technology, get connected to their doctors. So we really want to make sure that we have uh, these telehealth bags that people who may have a chronic issue and they need to be in touch with their doctor for a long period of time, that they could come to the library and they can check out the, the technology and take it home once they've learned how to use it. And then we also want to be a space for people if they don't really want to take technology home, that they have a place to go and to connect with people. And so if you happen to, if you need any more information or you want to be a telehealth navigator, or you know anybody you want to be a telehealth uh, navigator, um, we'd love to connect with folks to make sure that we have people in our libraries who can help people connect to health. Thank you. Members, um, I'd like you to open up, I'd like to open up to questions specifically on this project just because it is kind of new. If anyone has any questions now. I have a question. Go ahead, Representative Garcia. Thank you. A uh, question. How many libraries are actively participating in this right now? These these uh, telehealth tech bags and how many libraries currently have this available? So we are still waiting for the hotspots. So okay. we don't have any of the tech bags deployed yet. So as soon as we have the hotspots, we will be deploying the bags to um, more than, I think, 24 libraries across the state. Okay. Thank you. Particularly in areas that are um, rural. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I, I have a follow-up question to that. and um, I didn't quite get what the timeline and the rollout for this project is. I heard um, that it's been extended to May 2026. Sylvia, I don't know if you can answer that question, but can you give us a little bit more uh, sense of like when maybe the first one will be opening up, planned second, third, fourth? Well, what we're trying to do now is trying to, through emergency procurement, which I'm finding is not so much emergency procurement, um, really roll out uh, Kihei and Kahalui as soon as we can. We're also working, the next ones we've been working with are on the Big Island, um, so we're hoping for that. The Molokai, we'd like to roll that one out. We're just trying to figure out if we can with Stacy, with the um, the space and things like that, because we have a primary care provider who whose clinic is right across the street, and um, her internet does not work very well, but if she crosses the street to the library, the internet is really, really good. And so she wants us to set up over there as quickly as possible. Um, I think the biggest stumbling block I found is um, procurement. Uh, it's really, even emergency procurement, it still is not easy to procure like the office pods that we need to have the private space. We just got the purchase order in and I hear that Stacy is organizing the um, setup of the pods in Kihei and Kahului. Um, I put in the request in August before I retired, and we just got it now. So uh, I, I always wonder, like, what emergency procurement means if that is going to take so long. Um, and, and there's all these growing pains. Like Stacy said, you know, you get the hot spots but they don't work. And then they realize, we gave you the wrong hotspots. We have to replace all the hotspots. Um, so that, that has been our big stumbling block. But uh, CDC has extended our no-cost extension to the end of May 2026. So this will give us a very good opportunity to really open up the libraries and see how this works. 
and see how the mobile clinic vans work so that we can have really good data collected um, from this project because we are really evidence-based driven and we want to make sure we have the data just like from Matt's project for um, policymakers to know what's happening um, but people are very very excited about being able to get health care in the libraries thank you so and we, much we have, go ahead Stacy I'm sorry I was going to say we have done a few pilots we did a pilot test in Na Lehu and had a few patients who were able to go to the library and interact with their doctors and they were exceedingly um, grateful and that they didn't have to drive all the way to Hilo to have an appointment with their doctors. So I think in rural areas, once we can actually get the um, a, the cohort of telehealth navigators who can be in the libraries, that's when we can really fully launch the navigators. And once we get the hotspots, that's when we can launch the, the bags, the telehealth bags. Um, and then hopefully connect with all of the hospitals to let doctors know that they can tell their patients that if they need connectivity, they can go check out a, a bag from one of the available libraries on the island that they live on. Stacy and Sylvia, what I'd like to offer is please work with our offices and we can create some digital ads and maybe send them out to our communities, especially those coming out of high school who may be very well suited for these uh, uh, telehealth navigators. I really appreciate the thought that you've put into um, creating the workforce development ladder uh, that we need in the state and, and please connect because I know that all of my colleagues in the identified sites that you have will be eager to get this information out to their communities. I will also say thank you so much for focusing on Kihei and Kahului. Um, if there is anywhere that needs emergency procurement, it is that two sites. So we will also use our influence to encourage um, that process to move faster. Finally, um, so I, I understood the book bag, the, the tech bags and the navigators, but can you kind of paint a picture about what a pod is going to look like in a library? Because I don't think I got a sense of what that looks like. And again, I think this is an innovative use of space for the libraries. And the fact that you've already done some rollout in some very rural communities, I am very eager to understand what the site looks like. Mm -hmm. So the pods, I don't know if you've been over to the sandbox, um, uh, but pods are basically these portable rooms um, that are soundproof. And so the rooms that we are purchasing can fit four people. So it's like a, like a, a white box <laughs> that has a, uh, technology, uh, con connectivity, and furniture where um, people can sit and connect in a, in a quiet space with their, um, with their provider. So we'll have two four people pods right now, one going in Kihei, which is one of our larger libraries um, that has space, and one in Kah Kahului, which we are uh, working on to reopen faster than we've been doing a lot of projects, but um, given um, the um, tragedy in Lahaina, we're trying to open up Kahului a little bit faster and do work while we're open um, on the space. So um, that will be another four person pod that will, will be in the library and available for people. So even if we don't have a telehealth navigator, if somebody just needs a private space to meet with their doctor, we'll have that space ready for them. Thank you again, members. Any questions specifically on this? Okay. This is actually a nice segue when you folks were talking about the challenges of hotspots and it's unusual to have the state digital equity coordinator in front of the health and homelessness committee, but I think it's highly appropriate. So we're gonna delve into um, kind of the broader issues of, of why this telehealth is challenging, but why it's important that um, we are working at a statewide level to ensure what is basically the backbone uh, the infrastructure that needs to drive all of this innovation that's happening in our community. So we're fortunate to have with us Bert Lum, State Digital Equity Coordinator with the Hawaii Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism. He's going to give us a presentation on Hawaii's digital equity plan and telehealth. And I want to start off first by giving a shout out to your digital health equity hui that was meeting from the beginning of the pandemic and has involved so many of these people here around the table in conversations that have made this library pro uh, project possible. What a uh, number meeting are you <laughs> folks on now? This Wednesday will be the 181st <laughs> convening of the Broadband Hui. 
I want to congratulate you on doing that and commend all of the people who have been on that. Who we, I have not attended all 180 <laughs> that you just said, but I've attended a few. And you folks are doing critical work for our community. So I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Lum. Well, uh, <clears throat> you know, aloha everybody and, uh, you know, Chair Bilotti and Vice Chair Takanoichi and members of the committee, mahalo very much for, you know, having me uh, come on to this uh, information briefing. It's quite an honor. Um, my name is Bert Lum. I'm the State Digital Equity Coordinator in the Hawaii Broadband and Digital Equity Office uh, in DBED. And I, I do want to take this opportunity to also welcome uh, Chung Cheng, who is the Strategic Broadband Coordinator who leads up the office. And, you know, as a team, we are uh, now, you know, kind of uh, uh, embarking on our, our public comment uh, period. I do want to also mention that as much as, you know, people have said thank you for me it's not a it's not a one man job. This is like a very much a, a a group effort. And when we convened the broadband hui back in 2020 March of 2020, it was a result of the stay at home order. And what, one of the things that we recognized right off the bat was that you know if you're going to stay at home, you're going to do your education at home, you're going to do your work at home, you're going to do your telehealth at work home, you're going to do uh, access to any government services from home. So. A lot of that was uh, the, the real primary purpose of, of why are we convening. Uh, we wanted to address the, the gaps that existed back in 2020, which you know, for the most part kind of still exists, and, and what are some of the resources that are coming to bear that help to alleviate uh, you know, those, those uh, gaps. And you know, I, I, I won't bore you with uh, you know, the details of all 181 <laughs> convenings, but uh, it's been a collective effort. And if it wasn't for individuals like Stacy and Sylvia and Christina, and in fact, I think many of the uh, telehealth we have been a, a part of it, you know, we ha wouldn't have been able to move it as far as we have. So what I want to do today is kind of um, kind of go through high level what the uh, broadband activities are and digital equity activities so that from a telehealth perspective, you can see some of the work that's being done to support you know, this particular uh, s kind of specialty. I, I, I do want to um, start off with, uh, with this slide, and thanks to our friends at the uh, university who are also very, very much involved with some of the major infrastructure work. Uh, we'll start off with the, you know, I'll just go through some of the numbers. So the first one is the broadband equity access and deployment. And that one, let's see if I can move this bar here. Um, I think it's got it down for $149 million. That's an infrastructure project, but the E in bead is equity. So there's uh, a focus, a very much a focus on, on equity, uh, even in that infrastructure realm. Uh, you have the Coronavirus Capital Projects Fund, which is about $115 million. Uh, that is primarily for some key strategic infrastructure. Uh, like cable landings and, and inter-island fiber. Uh, you also have 90 million uh, that's coming into the Tribal Broadband Connectivity Program, which uh, is primarily for Hawaiian, ha Hawaiian homelands. Uh, we also have uh, a middle mile grant that was uh, won by Hawaiian Telcom at $37 million. Uh, and then these are all federal uh, funding. and. The ones that, that we're very much directly involved in are the uh, Digital Equity Act uh, programs, one of which is the development of the plan that I'm going to go into, and as well as something that I'll talk about uh, toward the end about the capacity grants. Uh, another one that we are very much involved in is the ACP, Affordable Connectivity Program, uh, which the FCC has uh, made available a, an outreach grant program. So. You know, we're, we're actually, um, we have subawardees that are actually going out there and actually helping to um, sign people up for the IACP. And, and to date, I think we're probably more than $16 million in benefits. So I think the last count, we were something like uh, 51 or 52,000 signups. Uh, we could be probably closer to 100,000, uh, 150,000 around there in terms of qualified households. So we still have a ways to go, but you know, with, with the grassroots effort, I mean, that's kind of like the numbers that we, um, we've currently achieved. Okay, real quickly, and I know, you know, I wanna honor the time that everybody has uh, 
uh, for this presentation. I want to just uh, focus a little bit on what is digital equity. People might have heard of broadband, but in terms of what digital equity is, uh, according to the digital National Digital Inclusion Alliance, which is kind of a national alliance, nonprofit that has uh, really pulled together voices from across the entire country. Uh, it's a condition in which all individuals and communities have the information technology capacity needed for full participation in our society, democracy, and economy. Uh, necessary for civic and cultural participation, employment, lifelong learning, and access to essential services. So that's kind of the definition that we're working from. And real quickly, you know, um, the digital equity plan was uh, uh, $570,000 that uh, was, was given to, um, actually the awardee was the executive office, uh, and it was subawarded to, to um, DBED. And our timeline for this was uh, probably about a year starting back in, um, you know, December 1st of last year. Uh, and over the course of this, this particular year, uh, our, our contractors uh, and us spent a fair amount of time working in community, uh, interviewing um, focus groups, interviewees across the entire uh, state. And so that's kind of the, you know, what encompassed the actual information that contributed to the digital equity plan. Uh, this is an important slide because the National Telecommunications Information Administration they are the ones that define what it is that we need to do to achieve a viable digital equity plan. And, and key to that was the definition of covered populations. And these are the covered populations that we focused our attention on. So it wasn't like we went out and, and, and spoke to everybody under the sun. Uh, it, it was really focused on uh, these particular communities. So it could be covered households, which are income constrained. Uh, you have kupuna, you have incarcerated in individuals, veterans, people with, uh, persons with disabilities, uh, individuals with language barriers, uh, racial ethnic minorities, rural residents, rural communities, and Native Hawaiians. So this is kind of the, you know, the focus. So if we're gonna go out there, we're gonna go and talk to these covered populations. Uh, you know, we've, we've kind of embraced this slogan uh, for the digital equity, pl uh, equity plan, he, he va'a, he moku, he moku, he ba'a. The canoe is an island, the island is a canoe. And we really see this as us in Hawaii having to be on this canoe, having to navigate the currents and the winds and the weather and the environment, uh, but to achieve this goal of digital equity. And, you know, we are in the middle of the Pacific. We've got to do this on our own. We can't depend on, you know, any, any state that's uh, next door to us. Our vision, all who call Hawaii home have the confidence, ability, and pathways to thrive in the digital world. And our mission is to design and enable systems that perpetually empower our people through access to digital resources. Now, these are, these are very key words because if you think about telehealth and you think about uh, the kind of um, uh, understanding of the technology that enables you to fully participate in a telehealth session, you know, that's exactly what the navigators are. That's what exactly digital navigators do. That's exactly what, you know, the whole idea of digital equity and providing these wraparound services to the, the, the broadband access. You know, we, we really um, focused our uh, design of the plan on, on something that was uh, really, I think, quite, um, you know, heartfelt from all the members of, of our team. And we drew upon uh, Andy Pilakipaki's uh, sort of acronym definition of aloha, and which is, you know, codified in, in uh, state law 5-7.5. Uh, and we really look at, looked at um, some of the key um, features, values of that uh, acronym, and also try to project over the next seven generations. So this is not a, uh, you know, sort of a five-year plan, and, and how do we, obviously we're gonna try to make the best use of the federal money, but how do we look at this as something that 
uh, is a journey that we're on for seven generations. And, and to, to just um, you know, emphasize uh, akahai to be expressed with tenderness, lokahi to be expressed with harmony, olu olu to be expressed with um, pleasantness, aha haa haa to be expressed with modesty, and ahonoi to be expressed with perseverance. And I end with perseverance for the 181st <laughs> convening. <laughs> Uh, um, this slide is uh, another important slide because you know it, it helps to cap, kind of capsulize what is under the the sort of the hale of of digital equity and and some of these pillars we want to emphasize. So uh, the first one is is internet access and that's sometimes referred to as broadband access, internet access. That's the infrastructure that we all are now looking at some federal monies to get you know get out into community. Uh, there's digital literacy skills. How do we help up, upskill everybody? And and that's why the libraries are super important uh, in helping to do this. There's a number of projects. Uh, the telehealth project is one of them, and uh, we got a congressional earmark to um, do a digital literacy mm -hmm. in the libraries uh, from um, uh, Congressman Ed Case uh, to the tune of $975,000. And And these projects are really uh, they're important projects in and of themselves, but they're also ways of us establishing good sort of benchmarks and best practices and how do we evolve this, you know, as we move down this timeline. Uh, you have access to devices, right? Not everybody has a device. And so in some of our digital literacy classes and, um, you know, this was largely, uh, I think, supported by folks like Paala Souza and, and uh, Kelly Whitty, where I, you know, in an environment where you're, you're doing not a digital literacy 100 class, you're doing a digital literacy 001 class. And how do, you, you know, how do people in that class actually walk away with something that they can actually go home and, and play with, right? So uh, we've, we've done some um, um, refurbished laptops and given those away in, in these uh, sessions. And so that has, again, provided access to devices. Uh, affordability, affordability is, is uh, right now, kind of the key program is the Affordable Connectivity Program, which is $30 off if you qualify uh, and $75 if you uh, qualify on, on Hawaiian homelands. And, and the fifth pillar is digital navigators, which, you know, I applaud the uh, libraries uh, for getting into the, the health navigator as well as uh, with, you know, with this um, uh, congressional earmark, they're getting much more into the, the digital navigator. And what we would like to do is we, we encourage you know, all flowers to bloom. And what we would look at is uh, how, how might we in the Hawaii Broadband and Digital Equity Office maybe create some sort of badging system where if you've taken like a, a North Star and, and you've done a certain amount of classes, you get a badge. Or if you've done an ACP sign up and you've, you know, successfully signed up, I don't know, 10 people, you get another badge, right? So there's a, there's a multitude of, of um, qualifications that we could badge and you could put that on your resume and and this is another way to sort of prove that you've gone through the program and, and upskilled and and perhaps qualify for a, you know a, a better job later on but anyway so those are some of the ideas that we're, we're sort of methodology you know just a real quick you know this is across the entire state uh, we did about uh, 40 focus groups we had about 430 32 uh, participants total we had interviews um, 59 interviews, interviews totaling uh, 63. So that's kind of a good, good cross section of the community. Uh, I'll quickly, I'll quickly mention um, assets. Uh, this is a, this is a, you know, an example of what we did uh, back in late 2021, which was part of our uh, assessment back then of the digital uh, equity ecosystem. And pass that so our members can see that. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. And what we, you know, really the, the path that we have been on uh, allowed us to recognize that there were things coming down the pipe. And some of these things were federal uh, projects or federal funding programs. You know, it started off with CARES. It started, it didn't, it didn't went to the Consolidated Appropriations, Appropriations Act. You had the American Rescue Plan, and then you had things like the um, Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act. So these are all programs that we knew were coming. So how do we best prepare? And so one of the things that we did was we did the uh, digital equity ecosystem map 
um, early before it was even required. And it became a, um, a nationally recognized um, uh, effort. Uh, and, and that was something that we built uh, upon and, and updated it uh, so that we could include it in the digital equity uh, plan that we, we just issued. Some of the um, kind of key barriers that we encountered uh, as a result of talking to a lot of people, and, and many of these weren't necessarily technical barriers. A lot of these were socioeconomic uh, barriers. Some in individuals didn't see the relevance of digital services and connectivity in their regular life. So we're not forcing this on anybody, but you know there are folks that prefer that maybe this technology is not, not right for them. Um, there's a lack of integration of digital literacy skills. And I think with all the uh, projects that are coming up with, with uh, navigators in mind, I think we're trying to figure out ways that how do we provide some kind of, um, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, some standardization or some certification. Um, there's emotional barriers. Uh, and we've seen them in some of our digital literacy classes where Kupuna would come and, you know, they'd be kind of shamed, like, oh, you know, I... I, I really haven't been able to uh, learn the computer. I, I gotta rely on my, you know, grandkids to, to teach me. But the the environment for some of these digital literacy classes are really uh, inclusive, and and they try to, um, you know, honor honor the folks that are there. And I, I tell everybody that uh, gets involved with this work, you know, you gotta really look through the lens of of empathy as opposed to looking through a lens of of privilege. And so that's kind of a key uh, thing that I think a lot of the people that are involved with this digital equity movement really do look uh, through a lens of, of empathy. Um, we need to balance the time spent online with outdoor activities. So, you know, we're not trying to say, hey, you know, um, move everything online. Uh, there's definitely a balance that needs to happen. But look at, look at uh, uh, internet access and, and the tools uh, that we provide through digital equity programs as, as just tools. They're just tools that help you, you know, sort of broaden your, your horizon. Um, everything is so Oahu-centric as expressed by residents on neighbor islands. And, you know, we, we purposely really made an emphasis to try to look at um, hearing neighbor island voices and try to hear what, what folks in rural communities are, are telling us. And, and oftentimes we, um, you know, since there's such a large population on Oahu, may seem Oahu-centric, but we, we made a, a very good um, concerted effort to, to get out into the rural communities. Uh, sometimes transportation, you know, getting to uh, a digital literacy class might be, might be challenging. Um, oftentimes, some people um, prefer to live off the grid. Uh, but interestingly, a lot of those folks that are living off the grid have uh, their Starlink <laughs> <laughs> terminals, right? Um, you know, when we, we did a, a sign-up event um, for the ACP in support of uh, Lahaina survivors, uh, in, in support of uh, the FCC, and, and um, a, a sign-up for something called DSNAP. So we went out there to support uh, the DSNAP recipients and, and how they might uh, also benefit from the affordable connectivity program. And what we did was notice that many, um, and it wasn't a requirement to get the ACP. It, as long as you qualified for DSNAP, you can get the ACP. Uh, but l many didn't have, you know, social security or, or birth certificates uh, or state ideas, IDs. So that's, that's sometimes of a challenge. Um, our public outreach needs to improve. We need to really, you know, get out there. And, and doing information briefings like this are, are really a great help. Uh, but we need to do more. This has to be something that is communicated across mm -hmm. the entire state. Everybody, you know, everybody you talk to down the street saying, if you say digital equity, they should respond to you. Say, hey, I, I know what that is. You know, <laughs> that's, that's our goal. Um, and of course, there's always, uh, you know, bureaucratic roadblocks and, and sort of the, the, the customer service mindset. Bert, I don't want to rush you, but I do want to rush you. We're okay, we okay. We've got to, uh, I want to leave some time for questions. Yeah, but right. If we could get through your, your, the rest of your presentation, I think th this is helpful because it's also giving us ways in which the public can interact. I, I, I do have a, um, a s couple slides that I can go through pretty quickly. Uh, again, this is just a strategy. Uh, these are the timeline and how it works. Strategy, objectives, uh, timeline. We were really focusing uh, for... Uh, our, uh, this the quality of the plan to identify key performance indicators and um, actions with partners. Now this slide is, is, is key because 
uh, the next following slides will go into a little bit more detail as to what the nine strategies are. But this one kind of gives you a good sense of what they are and, and how, if you are interested, delve a little deeper into what the strategies say and how you might want to respond to them. So um, inspire and welcome all residents to become lifelong digital learners. Uh, honor the diversity of our communities with inclusive and accessible online resources. And I want to point this one out because in number four, you know, one of the things that we were hearing and incorporated is advocate for expanded access and improvements to telehealth services as a human care solution. Okay, I wanted to point that out uh, for this group. Um, and then make devices safe, affordable, and available for all covered populations. And um, in this one, I also want to uh, draw your attention to objective number six, uh, you know, develop programs that, that enable incarcerated individuals to have access to devices while incarcerated that will allow individuals to, um, the second bullet, to obtain mental health treatment and access other telehealth services so that treatments may begin and or continue during incarceration. Okay? Uh, and I'll just go through these real quickly. Provide broadband connectivity where Hawaii lives, works, uh, learns, and plays. Uh, number five, provide affordable lifelong digital literacy training and mentoring tailored to the needs of covered populations. Uh, create a community-based digital navigator program. Strengthen disaster response capabilities and community resilience through broadband. So, you know, this is, this is a, a good one because every time there's a, a natural disaster and, you know, you can think of COVID as, a, as a, a couple, two and a half year sort of disaster, right? But then right after that, at the heels of, of that, you have uh, uh, the Lahaina fires. And the first thing people said as a result of that is, I can't get, I can't get communications. I can't, you know, get my broadband. Or I can't get, you know, uh, access to the internet. Prioritize funding and investment policies that advance digital equity, and, and we can talk a little bit about uh, some of the policies that we might be uh, helping to, to um, recommend. And uh, last but not least, integrate evaluation and data collection through implementation to measure progress and inform um, strategy development. Our, our, our um, Hawaii Broadband Digital Equity Office is, is in, stat in statute uh, uh, really an aggregator for, for data. You know, if you, can't, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So we, we totally believe that. Okay, uh, real quick, the timeline that we're in right now, as I mentioned, uh, the, the uh, broadband, uh, the, actually, I'm sorry, the digital equity plan was a year-long plan. So it started on December 1st. It actually kind of ends November 30th. So what we will do, do over the next uh, um, month and a half or so, October is where we're actually, you know, officially sort of in this 30-day public comment period. Uh, but we will take comments, you know, into November. Okay. Uh, but our goal is to actually get the plan written and submitted to the federal government at the end of uh, November, November 30th. Uh, but then our, so that's kind of like up to the, it says um, November 1st Hawaii Digital Equity Plan. Uh, this, this particular timeline, uh, I, I want to give you a little sense as to what happens after that. So on February 13th, that's the kind of the, we have a no-cost extension, so there's going to be some curing that goes back and forth between the NTIA and uh, us. Then um, around, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking late um, first quarter, we'll, start, we'll see something called the um, Digital Equity Capacity Grant Notice of Funding Opportunity. And so this plan is what leads to funding, federal funding, uh, for something called capacity grants. Uh, and, then, and then what we will do is we will apply for that. It's a formula base, so we will be getting somewhere between you know, 12 to $15 million. And then um, we will then need to do some uh, rulemaking, kind of design the, the grant program. And we're looking at probably around the, the summer time time frame for the uh, digital equity capacity grant program to, to kind of kick off. I do have another one um, that, f that fourth um, frame there is the digital equity competitive grant program, which is another uh, kind of formula base, uh, but the state doesn't administer that particular grant program. It's really open to uh, nonprofits and others to apply for. So 
uh, there's there's multiple opportunities for these federal funds. What I can I just ask something? When you say formula grants, is it a set formula, or if our plans are better than other states, can we get more money than other states? You know, I until we see the notice of funding opportunity, we won't know okay. exactly what um, entails the competitive grant. Even even for the ca uh, capacity grants, we're not quite sure until they actually come out with uh, the NOFO and the actual number. I, I have to imagine that more community participation could be better. I'm very competitive. So yes, I just yeah, want to make I, I sure agree, we, agree, we, yeah. we know what we need to do. Right. <laughs> um, I, I do want to add that um, what, I, what I don't have on this is, um, you know, um, Rep. Takanoichi, we, we, you know, we did the uh, digital equity grant program last session, and we'd like to kind of reintroduce something very similar to that uh, in the 2024 so that there's multiple opportunities for uh, grant funding, which some, you know, organizations may not be really interested in the federal compliance and the federal complexities associated with some of these uh, federal grant programs. So a state program would be really beneficial, and it also helps to address some of the, the gaps that might exist, um, you know, one grant program to another. So uh, I just wanted to, to bring that up again. Okay, so that's it. Um, this is where you can find the plan. Uh, it is at broadband.hawaii.gov slash digital equity plan in its entirety, 179 pages of it. Uh, but I would emphasize that you go to the, go to the um, strategy that sort of um, resonates with you and take a look at that and, and see if there's something in there that you'd like to add. And I know uh, Dr. Higa is looking at uh, doing a whole response for the telehealth community. So I really appreciate that. Um, another easy way is to go to our um, um, bit.ly link, you know, bit.ly slash HI, which Hawaii Digital Equity Plan comments. And this, that's where people can actually do online comments. Um, and that's it. Mahalo for giving me this opportunity. And can I'm you go back to the other slide? Sure. There? Which one? Um, that one right there. And I, I feel really bad that we're hosting this informational briefing on October 30th and that the deadline is October 31st. Um, I wish we had done this earlier, but with everything that's going on, we haven't been able to. And did you say that there will be an opportunity to continue to submit comments? Yeah, we'll, we'll take comments, um, you know, into like the second week of, of uh, November. What, what, you know, we're doing in the office is uh, taking all the comments and putting them together. So. You know, the sooner you can get them in, the better that we can sort of integrate them into a response. And I'm hoping that folks who might be looking at this uh, on TV right now can just just scan the code. Scan and the code. Maybe if they yep. want to input it'll, it, because it'll take again, you right there. If we can't have more community input, I think that's great. And right. I, I just applaud everything that you folks are doing. So even though it's October 31st tomorrow, you can still submit your comments. Yeah, and you know, um, we've been we've been kind of on the road. Uh, uh, through the month of October doing these uh, public comment and gosh, you know, October went by so fast. And then, and then the university team is, they are, their timeline and our timing is a little bit different, yeah. So now they're picking up steam and getting out uh, and we'll do this in the month of November. So they've asked us to kind of tag along when we are available to, to go out there, you know, together. So yeah, it's, it's uh, great to g actually go out and talk to people and find out, you know, face to face uh, we had some great conversations in Molokai. Uh, we went out to Hilo. We went out to, uh, we had another one in, in Maui. We probably do something again um, uh, in on Kauai. So Wonderful. Yeah. Um, members, any questions specifically for Bert? Go ahead, Representative Garcia. Well, thank you, Bert, for being here. Um, you mentioned the ACP program. So this past weekend, I had to help my grandma sign up for that. Oh, okay, great. Um, oh. And it was a hard time for her. So just doing the, the application on, on her phone. But it got done. Um, you mentioned that if you're not Hawaiian or on Hawaiian homelands, you get forty dollars off, right? No, uh, if you're if you're not on Hawaiian homelands, you get thirty dollars. Thirty dollars. Yeah, off. if you're on Hawaiian homelands and you qualify, you get seventy-five dollars. Seventy-five. Okay. Right. Now, does that extend to those who are on the wait list as well, or just those who are on have the actual homes? Because there are twenty-nine thousand people who are who are on the wait list. Uh, it's only the ones that are um, on in homes because you have to actually put an address. And, and with an address, they can, the FCC will then verify that you are, in fact, um, on Hawaiian homelands. Okay. So it's by the geography of the actual right, homestead. Right, okay, right. thank you. Rep. Takanochi, any questions? Uh, I just want to 
give a shout out. I mean, I think in your presentation, Bert, you said a lot about um, the partnerships with the federal government, and it's really our federal delegation that's been tremendous. I know Senator Schatz, Senator Hirono, Rep. Takuda, and especially Rep. Case have been working together with us. So I think this is a really good example of how we're like having to do this across government, uh, you know, across agencies. You know, it's it's really a kako thing. So yeah, and I I might add that um, you know the. The, the local governments, the sitting county, yes. sitting counties involved. You got Kauai County involved, Maui County, Hawaii County, and they've been all involved um, just because they've been part of the Hui. And, and I think a lot of uh, our efforts to get local voice uh, encourage them to be, you know, much more uh, active in convening things like the um, the Hawaii Digital Equity Coalition. So every county has a version of the Digital Equity Coalition. So it's yeah, it's across all government, local, state, as, as well as federal. And, and then the other thing that I would say, I, I hope um, we can point people towards the um, Pacific Basin Telehealth Research, PBRTC's website, because uh, other people that I would have wanted to invite it here, but we only have such a limited time, would have been Kelly Withy and Ka'ala Souza. So there's a lot happening with JABSUM, uh, with people who are going out there teaching di digital literacy so they can actually access uh, telehealth. Um, I wanted to uh, close out with any final questions for the members. No, no, uh, any closing comments from the? No, but uh, again, I really appreciate you giving us the opportunity to share how this kind of all fits in and weaves in, whether it's telehealth, access to government services, education, you know, remote work. You got to have the foundation, and, and this is the foundation. Let me end by saying, so uh, we have a lot of takeaways. We will be take a look at the resolution for the study. I think study is, is more important. We have to understand, and one of the concerns I have is that, um, yes, there's this, this rush to telehealth. We have barriers, but we also have to understand, is it actually resulting in quality health care? We have questions about reimbursement that we have to follow up on policies for Medicaid. Uh, and then I will also say, because it came up in, in, all, in basically all of the um, presentations, these covered populations are very important. And the next series of um, informational briefings I hope we have is going to actually follow up. So you guys were a great start for our informational briefing uh, series. Um, you know, there is gonna be a lot of work with um, incarcerated individuals pre-release. And so there's going to be an opportunity for skills, for making sure they stay covered with insurance, and then to make sure that they are connected once they get outside. There is uh, a lot of activity around Kapuna services, and there's a lot of activity around um, ho uh, housing services needs that the um, health community is addressing and helping us address for homelessness, for mental health. Um, and then of course, uh, I, I will also say, we're also gonna be trying to drill down on what's happening with EMS, because that place and space for telehealth and really kind of connecting our communities is going to be very fruitful. So with that, that's a little bit of preview of what's gonna be coming up and coming out of the Committee on Health and Homelessness. And I really wanna thank you folks for the work you're doing on behalf of the state of Hawaii. Um, we are the number one state in health because of this very kind of partnership that we see in front of us. So thank you very much and we are adjourned. <laughs>